Hints Towards an Essay on Conversation by Jonathan Swift. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anna Simon. Hints Towards an Essay on Conversation by Jonathan Swift. I have observed few obvious subjects to have been so seldom, or at least so slightly handled as this, and indeed I know few so difficult to be treated as it ought, nor yet upon which there seemeth so much to be said. Most things pursued by men for the happiness of public or private life, our wit or folly have so refined that they seldom subsist but in idea. A true friend, a good marriage, a perfect form of government, with some others, require so many ingredients, so good in their several kinds, and so much niceness in mixing them, that for some thousands of years men have despaired of reducing their schemes to perfection. But, in conversation, it is, or might be, otherwise. For here we are only to avoid a multitude of errors, which, although a matter of some difficulty, may be in every man's power, for want of which it remaineth as mere an idea as the other. Therefore it seemeth to me that the truest way to understand conversation is to know the faults and errors to which it is subject, and from thence every man to form maxims to himself whereby it may be regulated, because it requireth few talents to which most men are not born, or at least may not acquire without any great genius or study. For nature hath left every man a capacity of being agreeable, though not of shining in company, and there are a hundred men sufficiently qualified for both, who, by a very few faults, that they might correct in half an hour, are not so much as tolerable. I was prompted to write my thoughts upon this subject by mere indignation, to reflect that so useful and innocent a pleasure, so fitted for every period and condition of life, and so much in all men's power, should be so much neglected and abused. And in this discourse it will be necessary to note those errors that are obvious, as well as others which are seldomer observed, since there are few so obvious or acknowledged into which most men, some time or other, are not apt to run. For instance, nothing is more generally exploded than the folly of talking too much. Yet I rarely remember to have seen five people together where some one among them had not been predominant in that kind, to the great constraint and disgust of all the rest. But among such as deal in multitudes of words, none are comparable to the sober, deliberate talker, who proceeded with much thought and caution, maketh his preface, brancheth out to several digressions, findeth a hint that putteth him in mind of another story, which he promiseth to tell you when this is done, cometh back regularly to his subject, cannot readily call to mind some person's name, holding his head, complaineth of his memory, the whole company all this while in suspense. At length says, it is no matter, and so goes on. And to crown the business, it perhaps proveth at last a story the company hath heard fifty times before, or at best some insipid adventure of the relator. Another general fault in conversation is that of those who affect to talk of themselves. Some, without any ceremony, will run over the history of their lives, will relate the annals of their diseases with the several symptoms and circumstances of them, will enumerate the hardships and injustice they have suffered in court, in parliament, in love, or in law. Others are more dexterous, and with great art will lie on the watch to hook in their own praise. They will call a witness to remember they always foretold what would happen in such a case, but none would believe them. They advised such a man from the beginning, and told him the consequences just as they happened, but he would have his own way. Others make a vanity of telling their faults. They are the strangest men in the world. They cannot dissemble. They own it is a folly. They have lost abundance of advantages by it, but if you would give them the world, they cannot help it. There is something in their nature that abhors insincerity and constraint, with many other insufferable topics of the same altitude. Of such mighty importance every man is to himself, and ready to think he is so to others, without once making this easy and obvious reflection, that his affairs can have no more weight with other men than theirs have with him, and how little that is, he is sensible enough. Where company hath met, 
I often have observed two persons discover, by some accident, that they were bred together at the same school or university, after which the rest are condemned to silence, and to listen while these two are refreshing each other's memory with the arched tricks and passages of themselves and their comrades. I know a great officer of the army who will sit for some time with a supercilious and impatient silence, full of anger and contempt for those who are talking. At length, of a sudden, demand audience, decide the matter in a short, dogmatical way, then withdraw within himself again, and vouchsafe to talk no more, until his spirits circulate again to the same point. There are some faults in conversation which none are so subject to as men of wit, nor ever so much as when they are with each other. If they have opened their mouths, without endeavouring to say witty thing, they think it is so many words lost. It is a torment to the hearers, as much as to themselves, to see them upon the wreck for invention, and in perpetual constraint, with so little success. They must do something extraordinary in order to acquit themselves and answer their character, else the standers by may be disappointed and be apt to think them only like the rest of mortals. I have known two men of wit industriously brought together in order to entertain the company, where they have made a very ridiculous figure and provided all the mirth at their own expense. I know a man of wit who is never easy but where he can be allowed to dictate and preside. He neither expected to be informed or entertained, but to display his own talents. His business is to be good company and not good conversation, and therefore he chooses to frequent those who are content to listen, and profess themselves his admirers. And indeed, the worst conversation I ever remember to have heard in my life was that at Will's Coffee House, where the wits, as they were called, used formerly to assemble, that is to say, five or six men who had writ plays, or at least prologues, or had share in a miscellany, came thither, and entertained one another with their trifling composures, in so important an air as if they had been the noblest efforts of human nature, or that the fate of kingdoms depended on them and they were usually attended with an humble audience of young students from the inns of court or the universities, who, at due distance, listened to these oracles, and returned home with great contempt for their law and philosophy, their heads filled with trash, under the name of politeness, criticism, and belles lettres. By these means the poets, for many years past, were all overrun with pedantry, for, as I take it, the word is not properly used, because pedantry is the too frequent or unseasonable obtruding our own knowledge in common discourse, and placing too great a value upon it, by which definition men of the court or the army may be as guilty of pedantry as a philosopher or a divine. And it is the same vice in women, when they are over-copious upon the subject of their petticoats, or their fans, or their china. For which reason, although it be a piece of prudence as well as good manners to put men upon talking on subjects they are best versed in, yet that is a liberty a wise man could hardly take, because, beside the imputation for pedantry, it is what he would never improve by. The great town is usually provided with some player, mimic, or buffoon, who hath general reception at the good tables familiar and domestic with persons of the first quality, and usually sent for at every meeting to defer to company, against which I have no objection. You go there as to a farce or a puppet show. Your business is only to laugh in season, either out of inclination or civility, while this merry companion is acting his part. It is a business he hath undertaken, and we are to suppose he is paid for his day's work. I only quarrel when in select and private meetings, where men of wit and learning are invited to pass an evening, this jester should be admitted to run over his circle of tricks, and make the whole company unfit for any other conversation, besides the indignity of confounding men's talents at so shameful a rate. Raillery is the finest part of conversation, but as it is our usual custom to counterfeit and adulterate whatever is too dear for us, so we have done with this, and turned it all into what is generally called repartee, or being smart. Just as when an expensive fashion cometh up, those who are not able to reach it content themselves with some paltry imitation. It now passeth for raillery to run a man down in discourse, to put him out of countenance, and make him ridiculous, sometimes to expose the defects of his person or understanding, 
on all which occasions he is obliged not to be angry, to avoid the imputation of not being able to take a jest. It is admirable to observe one who is dexterous at this art, singling out a weak adversary, getting the laugh on his side, and then carrying all before him. The French, from whence we borrow the word, have a quite different idea of the thing, and so had we in the politer age of our fathers. Raillery was to say something that at first appeared a reproach or reflection, but, by some turn of wit unexpected and surprising, ended always in a compliment, and to the advantage of the person it was addressed to. And surely one of the best rules in conversation is never to say a thing which any of the company can reasonably wish we had rather left unsaid. Nor can there anything be well more contrary to the ends for which people meet together than to part unsatisfied with each other or themselves. There are two faults in conversation which appear very different, yet arise from the same root, and are equally blamable. I mean an impatience to interrupt others, and the uneasiness of being interrupted ourselves. The two chief ends of conversation are to entertain and improve those we are among, or to receive those benefits ourselves, which, whoever will consider, cannot easily run into either of those two errors, because when any man speaketh in company, it is to be supposed he doth it for his hearer's sake, and not his own, so that common discretion will teach us not to force their intention if they are not willing to lend it, nor on the other side to interrupt him who is in possession, because that is in the grossest manner to give the preference to our own good sense. There are some people whose good manners will not suffer them to interrupt you, but what is almost as bad will discover abundance of impatience and lie upon the watch until you have done, because they have started something in their own thoughts which they long to be delivered of. Meantime, they are so far from regarding what passes that their imaginations are wholly turned upon what they have in reserve, for fear it should slip out of their memory, and thus they confine their invention, which might otherwise range over a hundred things full as good, and that might be much more naturally introduced. There is a sort of rude familiarity which some people, by practising among their intimates, have introduced into their general conversation, and would have it pass for innocent freedom or humour which is a dangerous experiment in our northern climate, where all the little decorum and politeness we have are purely forced by art, and are so ready to lapse into barbarity. This, among the Romans, was the raillery of slaves, of which we have many instances in Plautus. It seemeth to have been introduced among us by Cromwell, who, by preferring the scum of the people, made it a court entertainment, of which I have heard many particulars and, considering all things were turned upside down, it was reasonable and judicious, although it was a piece of policy found out to ridicule a point of honour in the other extreme, when the smallest word misplaced among gentlemen ended in a duel. There are some men excellent at telling a story, and provided with a plentiful stock of them, which they can draw out upon occasion in all companies, and, considering how low conversation runs now among us, it is not altogether a contemptible talent. However, it is subject to two unavoidable defects, frequent repetition and being soon exhausted, so that whoever valueth this gift in himself hath need of a good memory, and ought frequently to shift his company, that he may not discover the weakness of his fund. For those who are thus endowed have seldom any other revenue, but live upon the main stock." great speakers in public are seldom agreeable in private conversation, whether their faculty be natural or acquired by practice, and often venturing. Natural elocution, although it may seem a paradox, usually springeth from a barrenness of invention and of words, by which men who have only one stock of notions upon every subject, and one set of phrases to express them in, they swim upon the superficies, and offer themselves on every occasion. Therefore, men of much learning, and who know the compass of a language, are generally the worst talkers on a sudden, until much practice hath inured and emboldened them, because they are confounded with plenty of matter, variety of notions, and of words, which they cannot readily choose, but are perplexed and entangled by too great a choice. Which is no disadvantage in private conversation, where, on the other side, the talent of haranguing is, of all others, most insupportable. 
Nothing hath spoiled men more for conversation than the character of being wits, to support which they never fail of encouraging a number of followers and admirers, who list themselves in their service, wherein they find their accounts on both sides by pleasing their mutual vanity. This hath given the former such an air of superiority, and made the latter so pragmatical, that neither of them are well to be endured. I say nothing here of the itch of dispute and contradiction, telling of lies, or of those who are troubled with a disease called the wandering of the thoughts, that they are never present in mind at what passeth in discourse. For whoever labours under any of these possessions is as unfit for conversation as a madman in Bedlam. I think I have gone over most of the errors in conversation that have fallen under my notice or memory, except some that are merely personal, and others too gross to need exploding, such as lewd or profane talk. But I pretend only to treat the errors of conversation in general, and not the several subjects of discourse, which would be infinite. Thus we see how human nature is most debased, by the abuse of that faculty which has held the great distinction between men and brutes and how little advantage we make of that which might be the greatest, the most lasting, and the most innocent, as well as useful pleasure of life. In default of which, we are forced to take up with those poor amusements of dress and visiting, or the more pernicious ones of play, drink, and vicious amours, whereby the nobility and gentry of both sexes are entirely corrupt both in body and mind, and have lost all notions of love, honour, friendship, generosity, which, under the name of fopperies, have been for some time laughed out of doors. This degeneracy of conversation, with the pernicious consequences thereof upon our humours and dispositions, hath been owing, among other causes, to the custom arisen, for some time past, of excluding women from any share in our society, further than in parties at play, or dancing, or in pursuit of an amour. I take the highest period of politeness in England, and it is of the same date in France, to have been the peaceable part of King Charles I's reign, and from what we read of those times, as well as from the accounts I have formerly met with from some who lived in that court, the methods then used for raising and cultivating conversation were altogether different from ours. Several ladies, whom we find celebrated by the poets of that age, had assemblies at their houses, where persons of the best understanding, and of both sexes, met to pass the evenings in discoursing upon whatever agreeable subjects were occasionally started, and, although we are apt to ridicule the sublime platonic notions they had, or personated in love and friendship, I conceive their refinements were grounded upon reason, and that a little grain of the romance is no ill ingredient to preserve and exalt the dignity of human nature, without which it is apt to degenerate into everything that is sordid, vicious and low. If there were no other use in the conversation of ladies, it is sufficient that it would lay a restraint upon those odious topics of immodesty and indecencies into which the rudeness of our northern genius is so apt to fall. And therefore it is observable in those sprightly gentlemen about the town who are so very dexterous at entertaining a visit mask in the park or at the playhouse, that in the company of ladies of virtue and honour, they are silent and disconcerted, and out of their element. There are some people who think they sufficiently acquit themselves and entertain their company with relating of facts of no consequence, nor at all out of the road of such common incidents as happen every day. And this I have observed more frequently among the Scots than any other nation, who are very careful not to admit the minute circumstances of time or place which kind of discourse, if it were not a little relieved by the uncouth terms and phrases, as well as accent and gesture, peculiar to that country, would be hardly tolerable. It is not a fault in company to talk much, but to continue it long is certainly one. For, if the majority of those who are got together be naturally silent or cautious, the conversation will flag, unless it be often renewed by one among them, who can start new subjects, provided he doth not dwell upon them but leaveth room for answers and replies. End of Hints Towards an Essay on Conversation by Jonathan Swift